Fresh Fire. How many of you have loved Fresh Fire? So good. So good. We love extended worship and ministry. It's amazing. I just want to be really clear. I, I love the church. I really, really love the church. And I was raised in the church. I grew up loving the church. You could practically just like change my address to like the church address. My parents were pastors, so I was there all the time. But when I talk about the church today, I am actually talking about you. I'm talking about your neighbor, I want you to right now, look around the room, seriously, look around the room, look to your left, right, front, back, whatever. You are the church. The church isn't just a building or a service, it's actually people. It's the people of God, and that's who you are. And if you haven't noticed, we're all different. Every single one of us, different. Aren't we happy? I could not handle more than one of me, I know that for a fact. I definitely couldn't handle more than one Sam. We are all different. We are all different, and that's amazing. We have different stages of life, different life experiences, different ages represented. We are all the church, but we are different. I grew up with my parents, like I said, in ministry, and along with being youth pastors, my mom did women's ministry my entire life. Um, she still does women's ministry. And during one of her uh, like little groups, um, they were not so little, but there was a room full of us kids, and we were just sitting there, you know, doing kid things. I'm seven years old, okay? I just want you to mentally picture a seven-year-old. And I'm looking around the room, and I'm like, you know what? Like, it's so great. We're, like, playing and having fun, but, like, there should be more. I just felt this thing. Like, there should be more. We could do more. So I go to my mom, and I'm like, Mom, what do you think if I did, like, a kid's service? Like, during your service, but, like, a kid's version of that. And she was like, yeah, yes, I love that. So that's what I did. I begged our children's pastor for anything she had. I said, give me all the old felt board stories. Give me all your coloring papers. I can vividly remember this cardboard box filled with like old curriculum and it brought me so much joy. It really brought me so much joy. And then I tell my grandma, I'm like, grandma, I'm gonna start this ministry. And she's like, I love that, that's so cool. And she's like, but you're gonna need, you're gonna need a, a mini little pulpit. We're, you're going to need something, because like I'm short, still short, had to lower this, okay? <laughs> you're going to need something, because if you try to, you're seven, you're going to need, so she built, she builds me this pulpit, and it was like everything to me. I loved that thing. It even had like a little lift where your pen when it fall. It was amazing. So I sit down at my little pink desk, and I, the thing I knew, I knew I needed a name, and I knew I needed a logo, which is so hilarious, because that is so who I am now. I love designing, and I love naming things. Um, so I sit down, and I remember being so frustrated at the age of seven going, I don't know how to spell ministry. Like, I just don't know. I have no idea. I'm still working on basic, basic words. But I was like, okay. But the power of God, kids' ministry, was born. We had the full thing. We had the game. We had the, the worship time led by kids. We had a, an awesome VeggieTale video clip because it was like the quintessential 90s youth group. We had the video clip, the game, the message. I get up there on my little pulpit, I bring the message. And then we do an altar call and kids gave their life to Jesus for the first time and the 1,000th time. You know how kids just kind of always come up. It was amazing. From a really early age, like seven, I saw that the church was made up by people of different ages, different generations, in different stages of life. But I found the importance that every age would have a specific place that they could encounter love, like to be known, like for somebody to know your name. And a, a very specific service for them that they could actually experience transformation in their own life. And then it didn't matter how old you are or how young you are, that we can all extend the miraculous. Now again, I love the church. I've always loved the church. I even love the church of 2021 and even 2020. I, if you haven't noticed, the church of 2021, 2020 is divided. And when I'm talking about the church, I'm actually not talking about just this service. I'm talking about me and you. We're ununified. 
it doesn't take very long to feel the disconnect, right? It's, we're socially, we're economically, we're medically, we're politically divided. But the one thing that we have to bring us together is Jesus. He's the center. It's him. It's it. And when we put Jesus in the center of all of those spheres, he actually is the one that brings us together. And the only way we can do that is if together, unified, we encounter love, we experience transformation, and we extend the miraculous. And if you're curious of what the future of the church looks like, I want to be bold enough to say today that the future of the church looks like a church that honors the past. A church that is thankful in the present and is expectant for the future. We're going to pray and we're going to lean into this today. Jesus, we welcome you right now into this room. We thank you that it is you. It is all you. And we lean into your spirit of unity today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we know that it's not God's desire for his people, the church, to be disunified. It is actually his desire that we would actually become one. Romans 15, 5, 7 says, Now may God, the source of great endurance and comfort, grace you with unity among yourself, which flows from your relationship with Jesus, the anointed one. Then with a unanimous rush of passion, you with one voice will glorify God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You will bring God glory when you accept and welcome one another as partners just as the anointed one has fully accepted you and received you as his partner. If we want to see the kingdom of God break into our life, that it would change everything, we have to first put Jesus at the center. Jesus is the one who unifies, just like it says in the verse, that it, he actually calls us partners. We are with him together. And in that place of togetherness, we're able to be unified with the people next to us. Unity is the is the fire that keeps, or the fuel that keeps the fire going. It is the thing in the middle. If you want your family to look different, if you want your own life to look different, if you want your community, your neighborhood, your city, your state, the nation to look different, you have to lean into unity. And the first step of that is honoring the past. Now I wanna tell you a farming story, okay? I know farming stories feel super on brand for me. I, I know I give off like some farm vibes. Um, but to be very clear, I do have some farm cred. It's like street cred, but kind of different, more like a farm. This is me on a farm, see? <laughs> but in all actuality, my parents and my dad's side, five generations of farmers. So my dad's the first one who didn't go into full-time farming. But I want to tell you this story, and this is before um, good old John Deere was on the scene, okay? Back in those days, they actually used two horses to get the job done. They were two horses together. That was the thing that pushed the plow. Now, how the story goes is you would never want to partner two old horses together. Why don't you want two old horses? Well, because they're, they're just a little slower, and, and they're just... They're just, they're just old. It's, it's just not best. But you definitely don't want to put two young horses together. Because if you put two young horses together, well, they are wild. And not so smart. Okay? But the perfect pairing is if you have one old horse and one young horse attached together with a harness pushing the plow. Why would that be perfect? Well, the old horse knows the way. It's done it. It has wisdom. It's got some miles behind him. And the young horse, the young horse has passion, and he wants to go fast, but they balance each other. Now, how ridiculous would it be if the old horse looks at the young horse and says, you know what? That's it. I'm done. I have been faithfully plowing for decades. That's it. I'm done. I'm going to just lay down right here while we are still attached. Go on without me. Oh, to be young again. And in the same way, how ridiculous would it be if the young horse would look to the old horse and say, you know what, you old timer, go ahead, take a break. You've been doing it a while. I can do it all by myself. Everything you have, I don't need any of it. I've got this all figured out. I need nothing from no one. Look at me go, I'm the young horse. 
You lay down right here while we are still attached. I hope you see where I'm going. We cannot be a church that does all the things that God has called us to do without being a church that intentionally honors the past, is thankful for the present, and expectant for the future. We are still attached. I want to share a story from somebody who goes to our church. And this story is of Geneva Clapp, who was in our first service. It was amazing. Yeah, let's give it up for her. Geneva Clapp, who is 88 years old, has been a part of our church for 35 years. Her and her late husband, Stan, intentionally leaned into generational unity. In addition to their own family, the Clapps always had their house filled with young people. In fact, young people seemed to be drawn to them. For years, teens from the church who wanted to learn more, drug addicts, needing a family, kids from broken homes, would fill their house, and the Claps would just invite them with love and connection. These young people would come for Bible studies, food, volleyball, and mostly for the feeling of family that the, steward, the Claps stewarded so well. People were drawn to the Jesus in Stan and Geneva, and they naturally, supernaturally poured their lives into others. And the result, broken lives were made whole. Addicts were set free, and people experienced true transformation that only could come from Jesus. Stan and Geneva understood that everybody gets to play. We are called to the work of the kingdom, and that means everybody, young and old. And when they came to the church in 1986, Stan joined staff and later established the food pantry and prayer initiatives, along the way inviting people from every generation to work with them. They saw their lives as an offering to the Lord, partnering with him and others any chance they get. The food pantry has since grown and expanded through the years, blessing our community week in and week out. At 88 years old, Geneva still loves to volunteer any time she can. Let's give it up for her. Yeah. They modeled this thing of generational unity. They modeled it, inviting people into their homes. And the vineyard says everybody gets to play, and that means everyone, from, from nursery to the nursing home. We need each other. We are still attached. To my younger generation in the room, I love you. My people, I love you. I, I, want, I want us to take a moment today and repent for the times that we did not honor those who've gone before us. That in the spirit of pride, saying, I have everything I need, and I need nothing that you have to offer. And I'm going to lean in for a second. Even joking. Okay, boomer. Y'all know what I'm talking about. If you don't know what okay, boomer means. It's like, okay, you old timer who doesn't know anything. That's code. Even that. We have to repent. We have to honor the past. We have to. It's God's heart. It's his mission for the church. And not only do we have to honor the past, but we have to be thankful in the present. And I know that feels tough because we've walked through one of the hardest seasons ever. Thankfulness doesn't feel like on the forefront of our brain. But in my house, we actually started this thing. Um, and my five-year-old and my two-year-old, Cadence and Everly, they actually made it into a game. And the game is thankful for and the whole premise of the game is we sit down to eat, and if you've eaten with us, you've probably seen them do it, and whoever says, I want to do thankful for, gets to go first. And we go, and we say what we're thankful for until they run out of things to say. It's amazing. It helps put thankfulness in front of us. Now, I want to be clear. I know we've gone through some really dark times, and standing here today, death, destruction, isolation, family brokenness is not God's best, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry you've walked through that. But we actually have the promise in the Bible that we don't have to be thankful for everything that comes our way, but we actually have the ability to be thankful in. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, be thankful in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you who belong to Jesus. Thankfulness is a practice. And in our house, it's become a game. Who could be thankful first? I want you to take some time this week and practice thankfulness right where you're at, no matter what you're walking through. We could be thankful in anything. Now, you might be on board with me. Love it. Honor the past. You can do that. Thumbs up. Love that. 
You might even be fine with being thankful in the present. Maybe totally normal, super thankful person. But like expectant for the future? A better tomorrow? Maybe you or you've read somewhere like, yep, this is it. The world as we know it, gone, done. Jesus, take us home now. Just done. But we can't be a church of the future unless we are a church that honors the past, is thankful for the present, and has expectancy for the future. And I want to stand here today and say that the best is yet to come. No, I mean it. The best is yet to come. And that phrase feels silly. It feels silly, and I hate that it feels silly. Because it's not a cute, catchy Christian phrase to navigate hard times. This is the Bible. This is God's truth. This is God's promise. What is his promise? 1 Corinthians 12, 9. It says, but it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart could imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. Do you know what God has prepared for? Let's read Ephesians 3.20. Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all of this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream. He will exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all, for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. This is the future. To the older generation in the room, I got on the younger, got to make it fair. I want to encourage us to repent for the words that we've spoken over this generation. It's the, well, they don't know. uh, They're entitled, all of it. All of it. We're still attached. Your words matter. Maybe instead of complaining, we begin contending. Maybe in those moments where you do see, wow, that is not how it used to be. Lean in. Be a mother, be a father. Pray, intercede. We need you. You're not done. Like the old horse and the young horse, we are still attached. We need you. And Gen Z, for me, they're not a nameless, faceless generation. Gen Z has names like Peyton, like Ethan, like Esther. They have names. They have faces. And let me just tell you, as a pastor of youth, they are on fire. They're on fire. And if you've seen them worship, you know they're youth with hearts on fire for God. They matter. December 2019, we had this radical encounter. It was, it was radical. It totally shifted. We've been doing youth ministry for eight years, and it's totally shifted our view of this generation. It was after following a Rev night, which is our Wednesday nights here with the youth, and let's just be honest. We were feeling frustrated. We were feeling exhausted. We've seen the cycle. We've seen them lit on fire for Jesus, and the next, not so much. Super passionate, and then the next day, back in the same cycle. And it was frustrating and it was exhausting. And more specifically, Samuel was frustrated and exhausted. My husband, love him. And as a good wife, as a good wife who loves Jesus, I said, I don't want to talk to you anymore. And I actually, I actually don't want to see you until, and I don't think I was this nice, but being kind now. I don't want to see you until you hear from God. So I go to bed. The next morning he tells me I had this crazy encounter. And he begins to retell this encounter in the middle of the night. The Lord led him to a verse in Psalms. It's Psalm 68. And I believe that this shifted the way we look at the youth, this generation. And I I believe it's going to bring clarity to you today. Psalm 68, 25. Leaders in front, then musicians with young maidens in between, striking their tambourines. And they sing, let all God's princely people rejoice. Let all the congregation, all the congregation rejoice. Bring blessings to God, saying, Lord of the fountain, Lord of the fountain of life, Lord of the fountain of Israel. This is where it gets crazy. Astonishingly. That's like, (gasps) like that's like putting a gasp in the middle. Astonishingly, it's the favored youth leading the way. Princes of praise in their royal robes, and exalted princes are among them, along with princes who have wrestled with God. Display your strength, God, and 
will be strong, for your miracles have made us who we are. Lord, do it again. This has radically shifted the way we see this generation because we're not just extending an invita invitation to attend. It's beyond that. We're actually giving permission to lead. We're giving them permission to lead. If you see any of our Rev stuff, it says the youth will lead. Go down there, it'll say the youth will lead. What does that mean? It means we need everybody. We need, we need everybody. We're still attached. We're still attached. And I believe what this next generation is tapped into is the fire of God, the actual burning passion for God. But we need you. We need the experience. We need the wisdom. We need more mothers and fathers. If this is, quote, unquote, a, gen, a fatherless generation, then church, we need to step up. Because if we are the church of the future, which we are, we are a church that honors the past, is thankful for the present has expectancy for the future. And if we do all that, if that is who we are, that's our model, then we actually have the ability to encounter love in every generation, to experience the actual transformation that only Jesus can do. And we can all, no matter how old, doesn't matter what, across political lines, across social lines, across generational lines, we can all extend the miraculous together. United, we are still attached. We need you. Let's pray, and we're going to go into worship. Jesus, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that it is actually your spirit that brings the unity. It's not us trying to be unified. It's you. It's Jesus. It's you. You are at the center. And Jesus, we invite you in right now that we could experience your transformation today. In Jesus' name, amen.